Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Water Data for the Nation webinar on modernizing how you access water data. Thank you for joining us today. First, we're going to go ahead and start with a live poll. In today's webinar, we'll be talking about how here at USGS, we are modernizing the way you access water data. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to submit questions as we will answer them in the second half of the webinar. If we are unable to get to your question during this webinar today, please send us an email at wdfn at usgs.gov. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on our website and on the USGS YouTube channel. First, let's start with a live poll. You can engage with this live poll by taking the photo of the QR code on the screen or by going to slido.com and entering the code WDFN. We're gonna hang out here for a few minutes as we see results come in live. It looks like we're having people from all over. We have a little less than 350 attendees right now, but thank you for joining and thank you for participating in the poll. Lots of people from Colorado, some people from Virginia. I saw some Washington, D.C. at the very beginning, Ohio, Georgia, Idaho. From all over. Wonderful. Thank you. Mount Airy, Maryland. I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. Wonderful. All right. You can keep responding to the poll. But we're going to move on and have our first panelist present. I welcome Emily Reed, Chief of the Web Communications Branch in the Water Resources Mission Area of USGS. Emily will share some background information with us about the current data delivery and our modernized approach. Take it away, Emily. Thanks, Nicole. So USGS is modernizing the way that you access water data, and we're going to tell you all about that. But before we discuss what the future holds, we need to look at where we're at now. So first, let me introduce myself. Hi, I'm Emily Reed. I'm the chief of the web communications branch in USGS Water. I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin, and I use the pronouns she, her. The USGS has multiple mission areas, and the Water Resources Mission Area is one of them. That's us. In the Water Mission Area, we focus on, you guessed it, water resources, and we've been sharing our water data on the web for decades. 
but our original system became outdated. So we created water data for the nation for the modern display of our water data, delivering open access water data products and services. And WDFA WDFN provides the same high quality water information that USGS has always provided, but now in a more discoverable, accessible, and usable format. We're grateful to our awesome team that makes water data for the nation possible. We're comprised of software developers, technologists, scientists, communication staff, operations and infrastructure experts, and product owners. Our team is proud of this modernization effort because it increases the visibility and access of all USGS water data. Our common goal is to provide the public with accessible modern water data for the nation. The work we produce for water data for the nation is user centered. We connect with our users where they're at, from internal USGS users to cooperators to the engaged average citizen. We use human centered design to drive development. Do you want to be a part of user testing? Send us an email at wdfn at usgs.gov and let us know. We're also transparent. We're using best practices for software engineering. And you can check out our code repositories on GitHub. We also regularly publish blogs providing updates on our technology. And finally, we are dynamic and the products we're creating are too. Because we use an iterative development process, our products will evolve with changing technologies just like most of the websites you visit do. Another panelist in today's webinar will be showing you just how dynamic our pages are. But before we created Water Data for the Nation, we displayed our water data on the web interface of the National Water Information System, also known as NWIS Web. And this is a part of NWIS Web known as the Legacy Real-Time Current Conditions page. These pages have been around since the 1990s, providing crucial data on water conditions for sites nationwide, stream discharge and gauge height. These legacy pages have been around for 25 years and they were groundbreaking in their day, but they've become outdated and difficult to enhance, so they're not user-friendly. And we wanna fix that. So we made the new pages mobile first, data first, and intuitive to use. And in order to do that, we needed to go from this to this, which is a next generation monitoring location page. It's like we're remodeling our house while we're still living in it. We started with our most prominent and visible room, the one that receives over 90% of our visit visitors. But in the coming years, we'll be remodeling other rooms too, and we'll do this all while still living in the house. So we will be making our plans carefully to avoid unnecessary dust and loud disruptions. We wanna say thank you to our cooperators, an important user group who help make our water, water monitoring networks possible. We've heard from you that you rely on certain functionality of legacy pages that is not currently available on next-gen pages. So to help meet your needs, USGS Water is working to gather more information on what those needs are and how we can meet them. Let's stay in touch during this process. Send us an email at wdfn at usgs.gov, watch our blog for updates, and talk to your Water Science Center point of contact. We're talking directly with them too. You can also use flags on the pages themselves to discover new content and features. We use the beta tag, which is shown in orange here, to point users to new features that have been recently added or are still considered experimental. Currently, the beta tag still appears on the next-gen pages, but it will be removed soon. You may be wondering, what else is changing? For now, the next-generation monitoring location pages are the first major component of NWIS Web to be modernized, and that's why you're hearing about it from us now. In the coming months and years, other parts of NWIS Web and water services will also be modernized and the legacy components decommissioned. Visit our blog to hear from us about specifics as our development plans unfold. But when are these changes happening for the next-gen pages? Right now, next-gen monitoring location pages are ready for widespread use. Soon, they will no longer have the beta tag that they have now. 
Your web browser bookmarks for legacy pages will redirect you to NextGen pages in March of 2022. If there are features you need that are exclusive to legacy pages, we're here to reassure you that you will still be able to access legacy pages until January of 2023. You'll be able to easily access legacy pages with the click of one link, which will be at the top of NextGen pages. Then in January of 2023, the legacy real-time data pages will be fully decommissioned and no longer available to access. Now I'm gonna turn it back to our facilitator, Nicole, where she'll share another live poll with you. Thank you, Emily. I failed to introduce myself earlier. My name is Nicole Phelps, and I'm leading the communications for WMA at USGS. Let's take a look at the results from our poll earlier. Many people joined from all over the country, um, and now I'd like to move forward and take a look at our next poll. What do you use water data for? The link for the poll is in the chat. And you can also join the poll by going to slido.com and using the code WDFN. Let's hang out here for a second and take a look at results as they come in. The great thing about Slido is that you as a participant, as an anonymous participant, can see the results of other people and sort of upvote them. So as we can see, this word cloud has a few people that are responding with recreation, and then there are lots of other diverse responses as well. We'll be sharing these results on our social media after the event. Sounds like a lot of people use our water data for analyses, like monitoring stream flow, modeling, some recreation. We know many people use the information to make decisions about recreation, like kayaking and hiking flood forecasting, of course, science and water management. That's wonderful. Participants are welcome to continue putting in responses to these polls. And now we'll move to our next panelist. So we'll hear from Brad Garner, a member of the product owner team in Water Mission area. Brad is going to give us a live demo of the next gen pages and we'll get an inside peek at our development process. Brad, take it away. Thank you, Nicole. Give everything just a second to catch up here. So just while I wait for the screen to catch up, just to um, give all, all of you a little bit of introduction, I really like this metaphor of the room that's changing. There we go. Um, we're going one room at a time through our house. So what I'm going to show you here now is one of the new rooms, right? This is a new monitoring location page. And we have a lot of new features here, but the focus is on current condition real-time data. These new monitoring location pages are, again, what over 90% of our traffic um, is. People are interested in the most recent real-time data. Let's take a look at one of these pages. So what you see on one of these pages, <clears throat> this is Trout Creek near Tahoe Valley, California. We have thousands of these locations all across the country. This is one of them. Prominent on this page is the hydrograph. It's that plot right there in the middle, you see? 
By default, you see gauge height. That's our most common measured parameter, the thing that we measure in the environment that people are interested in. And by default, you see the most seven days of recent data. You can interact with this hydrograph. This is an interactive hydrograph. If you have a mouse, you can move over it and see the values in the upper left hand corner. If you're on a tablet, you can interact with it using your touch device. And there's also a way to zoom in and out. There's a little control down here where you can zoom in and out, slide around, pan and scan. If you're interested in more than just the seven days of most recent data, you can use these pickers up here. Let's take a look at one day of data at Trout Creek. You'll see that when data shows up, sometimes there are different colors. That signifies different qualifiers, different caveats associated with the data. And the legend down at the bottom explains those caveats, fully explained. Let's take a look at 30 days worth of data. That's a nice common interval to take a look at. And you can see the Trout Creek here has been slowly increasing in its gauge height, its water depth over the last eh, 30 days. If you want a custom range of dates, you can put that here, start date, end date. And if you want to download your own copy of the data in a convenient format for your own analysis in a spreadsheet program, you can do that under retrieve data. If you're interested in something besides just gauge height, well, we've got you covered there. Most of our monitoring locations do more than just gauge height. If you scroll down to select data to graph, you can see all of the real-time data that we monitor. Let's take a look at discharge. We have other things here like water temperature, but discharge, stream flow, cubic feet per second, gallons per minute, take your pick. This is a very popular one too. So we can see that stream flow at Trout Creek has been increasing over the last month as well. If you'd like some context for the water data, you can do that. You can take a look at what the data was like a year ago, a year over year comparison. So now we can see the Trout Creek is a little lower than it was a year ago. The orange is right now, purple is a year ago, but Trout Creek is increasing. You can also turn on long-term statistics. We've been monitoring Trout Creek near Tahoe Valley for 60 years, so this Dotted black line shows the long-term daily average of stream flow here. So you can see that we're a little bit below the long-term average right now at Trout Creek. We do think that this hydrograph is the most prominent, most interesting thing to show the public, but we have a lot of other things we're really glad to have available for you on these pages. There's a data table. Instead of downloading the tabular data, if you'd like to, you can page through and see the data in this data table. We're really excited to unveil this new interactive map. We know a lot of people have been asking for this. If I zoom out just a little, I can see Trout Creek, our current monitoring location in the blue, a little pin in the map. But other near my monitoring locations are these red dots. And if I click on one of them, I would load up that monitoring location page. We also have flow lines. You see a dark blue, almost purplish line. Well, that's where the water is coming from. That's the upstream flow line. Where is it coming from? And then the downstream flow line is, where is it going to? In this case, it looks like it's going into Lake Tahoe, but some of the streams, some of the monitoring locations go all the way out to the river. And then we also have, I'm really pleased about this, this gray area. This is the watershed catchment area. This is where all the rain that would fall to the earth, if it falls in this gray area, that would eventually pass by our monitoring location. So these help you get a spatial orientation for the monitoring location. Many monitoring locations have affiliated networks. This is still in beta, so we're still expanding this over time. But what we do is we have multiple monitoring locations that we associate together to get some larger view of the region or the national water resources. And if a monitoring location belongs to a network, you can click on it here and see a map of the network as well as a list of all the stations that are a part of that network. If you're interested in more than just the most recent real-time data, well, summary of all available data will show you that. For example, at Trout Creek, we've been monitoring, well, we had some monitoring of dissolved metals in water from 1989 to 2002. This is a sort of an index of all of that. And if you wanna download or obtain those data, that's this link right here. We have a lot of location metadata available as well from the latitude and longitude to what county is it in, all kinds of information if you're interested there. And then finally, at the very bottom of the page, 
Many times we work with other agencies, federal, state, and local, to do this monitoring. They either help us operate it or they help fund the operation of these gauges. And you can see these cooperators listed down here at the bottom and click on them to find out more about them. Let me wrap this page up, this quick little whirlwind demo, going back up to the top to draw your attention to two more things. There's the classic page link. If you need to get back to our old website, the one that's been around for over 20 years, well, for now you can click on classic page and get back there. But as Emily mentioned in her talk, we are on a path to eventually decommissioning those pages. January 2023 is the first of those decommissionings of our current condition real-time pages. And then I would invite you to take a look at this menu up here. A lot more information about the kinds of data that you can obtain from a monitoring location and a lot of additional written information from our Water Data for the Nation blog to our educational material and our water science school. I'd like to tell you a little bit now about the approach that we take, how we do this work. So we hear you. We've heard that a lot of people would like more advanced views of the data, the water data, specifically multi-station views. What I'm showing you right now is our 20 year old approach to doing a tabular summary of current conditions, in this case, uh, in the state of Texas, across a state or across a network. This is a tabular view of 702 stations monitoring gauge height and discharge. Now this view is a bit dated, it's a bit old, but it's effective. And we hear that people are still interested in this kind of summary of multiple stations at a time. But we wanna make sure we proceed carefully here. What I've just done is I've simulated a mobile device right now. And our 20 year old station page that summarizes all this is not mobile friendly. You can see that if I was on a mobile device, I would be having to constantly move back to the left and the right to get this tabular view. And we know that over 50% of our traffic comes to us on a mobile device these days. So we need to be aware of this mobile friendly view. So we're thinking carefully about how to modernize a page like this. We're not just going to naively take it, the old, and put it into the new. We want to redesign it to look like the web of the 2020s, not the web of the late 1990s, as nostalgic as we might be for those times. Our second example I'd like to show you, people have asked for, again, some reviews of multiple stations at a time. This is a very advanced capability here that's not widely known on our current 20 year old website, but it's available called Build Time Series. If you know how to use this, it's quite powerful. But already on this screen, you can see a 20 year old approach to doing forms. I'm about to submit one form, which will produce then a second form. That's not really the way the web of the 2020s works anymore. But yeah, I can pick my favorite county and I'm pretty overwhelmed by the sheer number of things that I can try to summarize here. It's not clear whether I would want stream flow or flow rate. Why are there two options instead of one? Why, or maybe I just want depth below water surface. This is a pretty overwhelming selection of options for tabling data. And we know that these days we can do better because our data monitoring has evolved. But if I do pick the right ones, well then frankly, I'm down in an area that, um, I've been using this website for 15 years. I'm still not totally sure even now um, why it is that my radio button follows me down below the hard horizontal line down to the bottom, uh, but this radio button doesn't. So we know that this interface is not as friendly as we could probably redesign it to be, to be now. But we do know that if you know how to use it, you can get a nice summary, multiple hydrographs across many different stations, summarizing a whole network or a whole, whole region if you want. We understand that the value of this kind of thing, but if we went on, if we're going to modernize it, we want to do it to look like the web of the 2020s. So we proceed carefully. Third example, quickly, is people have asked for showing multiple parameters on one hydrograph. I'm at one station, Barton Springs at Austin, Texas. We monitor a lot of things here. What if we want to look at just three of them? Well, today we have that capability, but I have to know that I have to unselect by default. I have to pick the three things that I want, not four, or I get an error message. I have to know that I don't pick graph, but I have to do graph with up to three. That's because we added this in later, so it just became another option. And then I have to click the go button. It's kind of an obscure way to do this. 
But if you do all that, then yes, you do get an interactive hydrograph. It's a little outdated and it hasn't quite kept up with the way web browsers render things. This is not the best way to show an axis. So we know we want to improve that. And we know that it's not very mobile friendly. Um, I would have to pan and zoom to the left and the right to be able to see this hydrograph. And we know that that's not friendly for at least half of our traffic coming to the site. So we want to modernize, but we want to do it properly. Finally, now that we've talked about um, the way that we approach modernizing, I just want to quickly show you an example of how we do the work internally, um, very candidly. Um, this is an example of a feature that we are on the verge of releasing on our monitoring location pages. And we've used something, a whiteboard, it's a mural, to work as a team across the virtual space um, I happen to be in the mountains of northern Arizona. I'm nowhere near my colleagues, Nicole or Emily or anyone else you might hear from today. But we use these virtual spaces. And it's a multi-step process, but it's very collaborative. This new feature that we're about to unveil is some new text, some alerts that can appear on monitoring location pages. And we started by mocking this up copying and pasting, just doing screen captures and saying, this is what it might look like. And then we had a team meeting and we debated this and we added little post-it notes and we went through all of this. We tried to agree on a consensus of a general approach, but then we hand it over to our software developer teams. We empower our software developers to use the latest techniques and all their training to make a website that looks very much like at the web of the 2020s. But also on this mural, we know some of our software developers work deep under the hood. And some of them are newer here, so they didn't understand all the connections and how things work. Um, so we wanted to talk about how does the data flow today in our information systems? And we added in green things. This is the new stuff we had to add. So we discussed how we do it today. And then we had a vigorous debate about how we might do this. And you can see that we had one design that we drew an X through because we said, nope, we don't want to do it this way. We want to do a more modern approach. So we tried again and we de developed a new approach. Lots of green on here, new approaches to flowing the data from our internal systems all out to this website. And then our software developers way under the hood took this and ran with it. And here you can see where they got even more into the weeds and began to actually diagram out the cloud technologies that get bolted together. And they debated the different approaches that can work and lots of lines changed and moved on here. But this culminated in working software quickly, just in a short amount of time. It didn't take us eight months of analysis and huge requirements documents. This is what we call the agile software methodology. This is an example of how we approach that. So that's it. That's an example of a current monitoring location page, an example of how we approach modernizing so it looks like the uh, web of the 2020s, and an example of how we do our work as we proceed on modernization. I'll give it back to our facilitator to take it from there. And I do invite you to type your questions in into the Q&A and we'll be glad to field those here uh, in, in short order. Thank you, Brad. That was a wonderful demo and an awesome insight into our process. I hope everyone enjoyed that presentation. Now I'd like to share the results from the Slido that we were working on a few minutes ago, the live poll. What do you use water data for? That will come up on the screen in just a moment. We got a number of responses to that, almost 200 to be exact, and we have a little less than 450 attendees. So thank you for everyone to, uh, thank you to everyone for participating in that poll. Now we're gonna open up the live Q&A. I encourage you to submit any of your questions into the Q&A feature here in the Teams live event. As a reminder, we do have a number of attendees today. If we aren't able to get to your question, be sure to follow up with us via email by emailing us at wdfn at usgs.gov. Most questions come in anonymously, so we aren't able to follow up with you. I'm going to start by asking one of our panelists, Jim Kreft, to answer the question, 
Will there be a way to embed any of the views to a website? So that's a that that's an interesting question because that was actually one of the very first features we added uh, early in our monitoring location pages is the event ability to event, essentially embed the entire monitoring location page into the website. Um, but we actually haven't really taken it too much farther because the number because the 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 use case for it and exactly how to make it work effectively is is there's still a lot of work there. Um, so. I would say at this point, there's not an active plan to allow for embedding large chunks of the monitoring location page into another part of the, of, of the web. At the same time, we are building, we know that um, being able to insert an image graph into the, um, an, an image of the hydrograph onto another page is a key feature people use constantly on the legacy systems. And we are building and have a, 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 a beta implementation of a new graph image service. Excellent, thank you, Jim. All right, next question is for Candace Hopkins. Will the data still be available through the NWQMC's water quality portal? Yes, data will still be available through the water quality portal. And in fact, this year, we're going to be adding several enhancements to the water quality portal. For those who are unfamiliar with this product, you can visit it at waterqualitydata.us which allows you access to data from both USCS as well as several, other, several hundred other organizations and data are all available in the same consistent output. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Candace. I have another question for Jim. Tell us about the underlying data model and the cyber infrastructure that is underneath the hood of the system. Are you using Microsoft Power BI? Yeah, so we are we are not using Microsoft Power BI um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, we start if you if you sort of start at the beginning of the at the highest level where you were on how the data is presented on these new pages. We're starting with a system with a a uh, shared open source product called the US Web Design System, um, which gives access, to, which makes it so that across the federal government, we can build accessible uh, pages that, that meet many of the federal requirements in the first place. Um, and then on the top of that, we're layering uh, best of class open source libraries like the D3 plotting library. Under the hood right now, we're using like we're using um, for 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 our data structures, currently most of our of our of our um, servers and web services are based on classic technologies like MySQL, Java-based web services. Uh, we are also building right now, as sort of Brad laid out there, uh, new cloud-based services and cloud-based data processing approaches that uh, are allowing us to move faster and more effectively, um, and and spend a le less time maintaining and more time building features uh, as we as we move forward. Uh, the other thing we are planning on having more um, communication about new changes and new APIs and other things and and also sort of talking about our development process for some of these back end cyber infrastructure things because we've been doing a lot of really cool stuff that I really would like to share. Awesome, thank you, Jim. I'm really excited about what we're sharing as well. All right, I have a question for Brad. What's the meaning of the blue color in the graph? Maybe process data, quality control data? Yeah, so that's a that's a very very fair question. Um, I could try to share the screen, but actually, I can. You know what? I'm thinking about it. I'll just tell you right here. Um, when I showed you a one year worth of data, you saw several different colors. Um, you saw some orange data and you saw some blue data. You're welcome to go to the pages right now and try it yourself. Those particular colors show whether we have approved the data or whether they're still provisional. 
So in USGS, we have real-time sensors constantly monitoring at thousands of locations, and we call that provisional data. That means that it may still change. We have our technicians and our data analysts who ensure that corrections have been made if there is a sensor that's a little inaccurate. And then finally, we, we approve the data. That means in theory, human eyes have looked at it and we think that it's the best that it can possibly be and it shouldn't change any more in the future. So especially when you look over a long period of time, you will see some data that's approved, that was the blue data, and you'll see some data that's provisional, that was the orange data. And just as a reminder, the, uh, the legend at the bottom will always show you um, what all of those meanings are. We try to explain every color and every shade and dot on the hydrograph. Thank you, Brad. Excellent. Brad, I have another question for you. Can you show exactly how to get the table view instead of the hydrograph view? Brad, I encourage you to go ahead and share your screen if you'd like. Sure, yeah, I'd be glad to. Great, thanks. All right, hopefully that, that hopefully we're working now. So here is a new monitoring location, and I'll show you two different ways to look at a tab tabular view of data. So one approach is on the page itself, there is down here just below select data to graph, the hydrograph data table. And this is many different pages of data, so you can page one page at a time through, and you can see the actual values. Now, in this case, I'm looking at one year's worth of data. Um, that's 1,986 pages. That would be, that's, that's quite an endeavor to look through that. It's more manageable if you're just looking at seven days. Let me show you the other way. If you want to retrieve the data, you can say, show me the current time series data. You click retrieve data, and then you say current time series data, and then you click retrieve. And what this is going to do <clears throat> is give you a tabular uh, data set that you can then do file, save as, save it to your computer, and then open it up in uh, Microsoft Excel, Google Sheets, any number of things. You can use something like the R data analysis package. Um, it's very easy to import these data, and then you can do whatever you want to with them in a tabular format. So that's two ways to get the data. There are more, but from the monitoring location page point of view, that's a pretty good way to, 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 to look at it. Thank you, Brad. All right. Now I have a question for Fauna. Can you overlay the National Weather Service flood stages, action, minor, moderate, major, then use those for querying purposes, like filtering the stream monitoring data for any date that NWS minor flood stage was exceeded? That's a great question because those flood stages are very, very useful for a lot of people. We currently do not have the ability to filter our data by flood stages, but I think that's a very interesting feature request and we'll add it into our, our queue. Thanks to whoever submitted that for the idea. Excellent. Thank you, Shauna. Shauna, I have another question for you. How does this relate to the new dashboard? That's a good question. So our monitoring location pages work together with the National Water Dashboard. The National Water Dashboard, if you haven't seen it, is just an excellent way to search through active sites and get a great at a glance view of the water conditions of the nation in a map. And so when users are, are on the National Water Dashboard and they want more details or they want to review the historical records for a, a site, they can use the links on that monitoring location to get to water data for the nation and check it out on our monitoring location pages. We are really working here to help our users transfer back and forth between these two excellent products and let you all determine what's best for you. Thank you, Shauna. Brad, I have another question for you. 
Are you able to compare the stage height to a user defined stage for a period of time? For example, how many days did the stream monitor exceed five feet? How many hours? That's an interesting, <clears throat> intriguing question about uh, essentially a form of data analysis. And we don't currently have, we've actually never had any kind of website that allows that kind of uh, user defined threshold and then looking above or below like that. Um, but it is it is a feature that we could consider. Um, we always have to weigh uh, the balance between keeping a monitoring location page um, straightforward for the general public and then providing those sorts of advanced, advanced features. The one thing I could say is that kind of advanced analysis is certainly something that um, a data analyst could do in one of the increasingly popular systems these days for data analysis, like the R programming language. And here at the USGS, we have a, a software library called Data Retrieval, which lets you pull in our water data directly into a package like, like R and work in that environment to do those kinds of ad hoc analyses and really start digging deeper into your analysis of the data. Excellent, thank you, Brad. Candace, I have a question for you. Will there be changes to groundwater well data that is on the USGS website? Right now, we are discussing changes to stream, to stream gauges, but what about groundwater monitoring wells? Yes, that is an excellent question. And as it turns out, we have these monitoring location pages available for every single monitoring location, regardless of data type. So whether it's a surface water or a groundwater site, and whether we have water quantity, water quality, or water use data, we have one of these pages stood up for that monitoring location. So if you happen to be on the legacy site for one of our old groundwater wells, you can go ahead and click on the link and see the new modernized page for that groundwater site. Thank you, Candace. Candace, I have another question for you. We noticed that the well status codes, dry, frozen, et cetera, have been simplified. Why is that the case? And can we get those codes back? Yes, that is an excellent catch. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And thank you to our users who brought that to our attention. This is a problem that we are actively researching and trying to figure out a really quick solution to. So please keep watching groundwater sites, keep looking at those data, um, and we'll let you know when we are ready to roll out a better implementation of groundwater levels. Awesome. Thank you, Candace. Brad, I have another question for you. How will the monitoring location page URLs change compared to the legacy URLs? Will the new monitoring location pages be at a different URL than the legacy pages once the legacy pages are deprecated? Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure, be glad to. So we will be doing new URLs for the new monitoring location pages. If you go to one today, you'll actually see that it looks very different um, than the old ones. The old ones are running in parallel with the new ones and they're at different URLs. Our strategy in general is going to be using what are called redirects. So if you go, say it's three years from now and you had a bookmark that went to a legacy current condition real time page, and we've gone ahead and decommissioned those old pages, our systems will detect you're trying to go to one of the old URLs and they will redirect your web browser to the new URL. Um, one little thing I'll add on to that is um, when we first designed these URL patterns that the old pages use, that was 20, that was 25 years ago. Um, we don't want to be boxed in with the approach that we took 25 years ago. Frankly, we had to make some co design compromises because computers weren't as powerful and networks weren't as capable back then. We're wanting to have a nice, clean, elegant new URL pattern moving forward. And we think we're, we're pretty excited about the patterns that we're coming up with. We think that they're intuitive and we think there's an elegance to them. But we do hope redirects will let your old bookmarks and potentially even your old software if you have automated scripts uh, be able to transition from the old URLs to the new. Excellent. Thank you, Brad. 
Jim, the next question is for you. Any plans to expose the backend API calls used to retrieve the data used by a specific location page that might help the software developer audience? It's a great question. We've actually kicked around that just that question, just that idea, having a section on the page that's showing the different APIs that are used to build the page. And we'll be doing more research to figure out whether that's something we'll do in the future. Um, that said, we are planning multiple different ways to reach out to the developer community. And I would invite you to send us an email um, at WDFN at USGS.gov if you'd like to participate in being a tester for our new APIs or for some of our other documentation and other resources that we're working to improve, that we're planning on building to improve the developer experience. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. This next question is for Brad. Why would someone be concerned about losing the legacy pages in 2023? Is there any reason this is particularly important? I'm trying to understand the impact of the website changes. We want to help you understand that impact. Brad? This is one of my favorite kinds of questions. It, it's sort of almost a philosophical question, um, I think. I, I really appreciate the question. Why would someone be concerned about an old page going away? Well, uh, to a first order, um, change can be difficult. Um, I, one of the analogies I use is um, I use online banking applications, right? I'm not a banker, I'm just, a, I'm just an American, but I use my online banking application uh, to keep my daily workflow and going in my life. And if I come up Monday morning and suddenly the whole app has changed and no one has told me about it and everything's in a different spot, even if they tell me they're like, don't worry, everything is still here. You can still do transfers and withdrawals and pay your bills. Like I have a certain reaction to like, but yeah, but things have moved. Uh, this isn't my job to learn this new piece of software. So we're trying to respect the fact that for 25 years, our real time data and our general presentation of water data has looked a certain way. And we know that if we change that, that could produce a same response in people that I have when my banking app changes. But just like my banking application, um, over the long term, a new application, a new way of looking at it is going to be more powerful. There will be new capabilities, things that I was never able to do before. So we know that technology marches forward. Um, but because our, our water data pages are integrated into the daily workflows of so many people, from kayakers to emergency managers to dam operators, we know that moving pixels around and changing the way they work could be something that we need to respect and communicate with you just like we are today about these changes. Thank you, Brad. The next question is for Candace. Has the tabling behavior data download process for lab results changed? The link to this data was shown, but will it be easier to choose parameters? That's an excellent question. And at this point, these new monitoring location pages do not have a new data flow for our discrete sample data. However, during this upcoming fiscal year, so fiscal year 2022, we are going to be rolling out a new system for both data storage as well as data dissemination for discrete sample data. Please be on the lookout for a new data flow, which will include data in tables on these monitoring location pages, as well as a new way to both query, search, and download discrete sample data. Thank you, Candace. The next question goes back to Jim. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you for attending. It's great to see all of the location metadata you expose through the dashboard. Are the metadata fields you collect based on an existing data standard, or is it USGS specific? The short answer is that the more metadata fields that are there are USGS specific that developed over the course of many decades. But there is actually a project right now um, that is reconsidering our monitoring location metadata um, to both work within um, standards that now exist around but that have been developed through the Open Geospatial Consortium, um, as well as other components to really figure and as well as uh, thinking about and stepping back and saying, hey, 
is this field necessary? Is this what we what we need to do? Is are there better ways of managing this information? So you can expect to see a lot of changes in that meta, set of metadata over the course of the next couple of years. Awesome, thank you, Jim. The next question is for Shauna. I use the daily averages and compare them to historic daily averages for the same dates to report to state water managers. Will this still be available? OK, that's a good question. Um, we currently have not pulled the statistical data into these new pages, though they are still available on the legacy and with web and the legacy um, services, certainly. These are both uh, these are both accessible from links on the monitoring location pages, but looking into the future, I think is where the question is. Um, we certainly intend to keep this daily data publicly available, and as we design what that's going to look like on the page, both visually as well as like down how you end up downloading that to continue that workflow, um, we'll be sure to test it out with our users and communicate it out to you. So. If the questioner or anyone else who's interested in that is interested in participating in early user testing, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Shauna. Before we move to our next question, I'd like to briefly pause and move to our last Slido, our live poll of the session. We want to make sure that you are receiving the communication about this in a way that best suits you. We've given a few examples here, but feel free to input anything that comes to mind. What format of communication would work best for you? You can join this poll by going to slido.com and entering the code WDFN. And in just a moment, I'll put the link in the chat. While we get responses for that, I'd like to move on to our next question, which is for Emily. Will the remodeling of the house, moving from our metaphor earlier, when will it be ready for us to use? So there are certain parts of the house the remodeled house that are already ready to use, such as the next gen monitoring location pages, which you saw a demo of today and that are currently um, available publicly and for all sites for which we have um, USGS water is providing data. Regarding other parts of NWIS web and water services that we have plans to modernize, these plans currently are in place through 2025. So we have another couple of years ahead of us of modernization work. And this is based on our um, best available information related to availability of funding, timing of other modern modernization projects that are upstream of the front end delivery to the public. And also we know that there are new data types that USGS is regularly um, developing and releasing that we also need to accommodate. So because any of those factors can change and probably are likely to change, um, it's hard to say when we'll really be done. And that's one of the reasons why we're using an agile approach that we talked about earlier to make sure that we're prioritizing the highest, um, the components of the house, if you will, um, our data delivery system that are most valuable to users, um, all while complying with IT security requirements and other requirements for just building a robust system. Thank you, Emily. Also, I'm grinning right now because I'm really excited about all the responses that are coming into our poll. Thank you so much for these. And thank you for the little comments that we've seen about um, our social media posts being good and appreciation for this webinar. We appreciate you being here. So to continue for just a few more minutes with our Q&A as we reach the end here, the next question is for Jim. We're using the REST APIs specifically the, the four IV and even the legacy services. Any plans to change or retire these APIs? Are the URL based request pages going to remain after 2023? Or is there another API in the works? We regularly pull tabular data, which is used for fishery releases. So the short answer is, well, these 
uh, AP, those APIs for off of water services are going to change and be eventually be replaced. But the time frame has not is not tied to the announcements. What we're talking about here to the monitoring location pages, um, and there will be a lot of communication and a long time to be able to, to transition to the new pages. I would really appreciate what a, reaching up, sending an email to uh, WDFN at USGS.gov so that I can reach out to you. Um, and other other members of the team can reach out to you to to make sure that we are meeting your needs uh, for automated data retrieval with our new systems. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. As we reach the five minute mark here, I'd like to transition and ask everyone. To consider filling out our feedback form. How are we doing? How is our communication doing? How are the new pages suiting your needs? Fill out this form. We'll post the link in the chat in just a moment. I'd also like to remind everyone to submit your questions via email at wdfn at usgs.gov. We have about 50 questions that we aren't able to get to today, and we want to talk to you, so send us an email. As a second to last question, or maybe third to last question, I'd like to go back to Jim for a moment. Will it be possible to build our own networks links to add the affiliated networks link now in beta? Yes, uh, that is one of the networks and networks management is one of the uh, parts of the monitoring location data uh, monitoring location data model refresh that's that's in progress right now. So right now you can technically change those those um, networks, but it's it's an involved process, a lot of manual steps, but there is a plan to make it so that. Different individual USGS users um, can make changes to those networks. Great, thank you. Let's get just a couple more questions in before we finish up. Shauna, this one's for you. Will the ability to generate graphs for presentation features still be available? This is a good question, um, and I don't have a, a great answer. At this point, we're not sure. There's a lot of complications here. First of all, we have heard this before, and we do know people use it to present in all sorts of arenas. Um, but what it means to be presentation quality is a little bit ambiguous and um, will require us to, to think about what exactly we would be providing for everybody. So it certainly is on the list of features, and it has been requested several times before. So we will um, keep it in mind and let you know uh, one way or the other, truthfully, about whether or not that feature will come through. Thank you, Shauna. I really appreciate your honesty and acknowledging that, you know, while we may not have a perfect answer at this time, we'll absolutely keep you updated. Candace, this question is for you. Will the USGS data downloaded from NWIS USGS webpage be from water quality portal be the same? I suppose they should be, but I do some different, I do see some differences occasionally. To clarify, by from water quality portal, I refer to specifically downloading data from water quality portal via the R package. Yeah, that's a great question. And one of the really exciting things that's going to be happening this year is that USGS data are now going to be disseminated using the WQX 3.0 data standard. So in starting to comply with serving data using this data standard, the data coming out of both the WQP, Water Quality Portal, as well as all of our USGS products should match identically. Awesome, thank you. Brad, this question's for you. Will all the items listed under classic data inventory be available once the legacy sites away? It's a very big question and a very good one. Um, the answer is uh, quite possibly not everything. So one of the challenges we're, we're having here is we built a very big web presence <clears throat> over the last 25 years, and it's very challenging to maintain it. We are really working on understanding the most valuable data. So I'll give you a couple of examples of things that will definitely still be around. Um, 
Our daily values data is currently under the classic data inventory, and that is a unique data set that's actually primary record if you go back into history a little bit. We will find some way to bring daily values forward. I'll give you another example. Um, annual peaks data, uh, also called peak flow. That's a uniquely valuable data set, right? Um, that's also going to find some way to be brought forward. But there are some other things, and um, I'm not committing to this one way or the other right now, but for example, we have something called a water year summary report. Um, it's been around for about seven years. Do we need to still continue generating this particular printer friendly tabular form of summarizing one year of water data? Or do our usage statistics suggest that people have moved on to other forms of analysis and packaging up of water data here in the web of the 2020s? That's the kind of question we'll be asking as we go module by module down that classic data inventory, evaluating um, whether we keep or modernize or what the disposition is on those. Thank you, Brad. That was our final question of the day. Thank you to everyone who attended and participated in our live polls. And I encourage anyone who's interested to send us an email at wdfn at usgs.gov if we weren't able to answer your question, if you'd like to be a user tester, and if you have any other things to say, please fill out our feedback form by following the link that we placed in the chat. This recording for this webinar will be available on YouTube and on the USGS WMA website. Thank you to everyone. We'll see you soon.